Last time we finished Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim from Surah Al-Fatiha and today inshallah we are going to continue with Surah Al-Fatiha to see where we can reach. Just for those who are joining for the first time this series of tafsir is intended to move us from intellectual students of the Qur'an to practicing Muslims who turn the knowledge of the Qur'an into something tangible, practical, and beneficial. The purpose of the revelation ultimately is not just the recitation of the Qur'an, whether our voices are beautiful or not. It is not even just the memorization of the Qur'an. It is to benefit us from the Qur'an. And the only benefit, the only benefit we can have from the Qur'an will come when we study the Qur'an deep enough, broad enough, and turn that study into practice. The Qur'an is meant to be practiced. It is not meant to be just one more copy of the Qur'an walking on two legs. So as we have spoken last time, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is the entry point to Al-Fatiha and it is the entry point Al-Fatiha is the entry point to the Qur'an. One of the reasons it's called Al-Fatiha because it is used as Fatiha and as Fatiha for the Qur'an itself. Al-Fatiha, uh, the Qurtubi, counted about 27 names for Surah Al-Fatiha. Among those names is, of course, Al-Fatiha, Al-Shafiya, Al-Kafiya, Al-Ibtida, and so many other 24, 23 more names. Uh, we can go over those if you like to, but those are uh, names that reflect the qualities and the benefits of Al-Fatiha. Uh, the reason it was called Al-Shafiya is because it is used as a Ruqya. Ruqya for Shifa. Uh, it is said that a group of Sahaba were in a journey or a trip and they met a leader of a community on their way and those community invited them and told them our leader is sick he has been bitten by a snake and we don't know what to do so is there any one of you who could help so one of them volunteered and said yes what would you do he said show me your leader and when he saw him he read Al-Fatiha and the companions objected. They said, who told you that this is a Ruqya, this is for Shifa? He said, I know that it is and let us ask the Prophet ﷺ. So the people of this family or tribe or community, uh, after their leader was really cured, they gave them a sacrifice, a goat or lamb or something. And when they went to the Prophet Wasallam, they asked him, uh, he made something that we have not seen you doing and he's using the Quran his way and stuff. He said, what made you think that it is a cure? He said, just the contents of it. Show me that it is cure. He said to them, give me a share of the sacrifice you received. The gift you got from the tribe, give me a share in recognition and approval 
that yes, al-fatiha is a shifa and it can be used for ruqya. The Prophet ﷺ himself, before he goes to bed, he would read al-fatiha, he would read the first five ayat of Surah al-Baqarah, ayat al-Kursi, the th last three ayat of Surah al-Baqarah, then Surah al-Ikhlas, Surah al-Falaq, and Surah al-Nas, and he would blow with his wet mouth into his hand and would rub over his head and the rest of his body as a way of self ruqya to give ruqya to himself before he would sleep. So all of these are part of the ruqya and the ayat that I just named are known for a ruqya, it is called ruqya ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud he learned this from the Prophet Sallallahu and he cited Aisha radiallahu anha narrating the hadith that the Prophet did this before he would submit to sleep. Uh, Al-Fatiha also is called Al-Kafiyah which means it is a protection. If, if you are facing something difficult, uh, you could read Al-Fatiha. If you memorize Yaseen, you could use Tiqra Yaseen. Yaseen uh, Ibn Kathir mentioned uh, a hadith that is uh, related to uh, up to Ibn Abbas, who says that Yaseen ما قرأت ياسين لأمر عسير إلا يسره الله تعالى ياسين is never recited for anything difficult except that Allah would make it easy the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم therefore advised us to read ياسين on someone who is in the process of dying to make it easy for him and ask Allah to make it easy for the dying person so if you don't if you don't memorize Yaseen, Al-Fatiha is kafiyah. It is enough also to help make things easy and enough as a protection and as ruqya as we mentioned. So, uh, of course, we all understand that before you read Quran altogether, whether it is Al-Fatiha or anything else, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Whenever you initiate the recitation of the Qur'an, seek Allah's protection from a shaitan al-rajim. Uh, scholars, they, dis they have this agreement that whether or not seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ is part of the Qur'an, but uh, it is clearly an, an instruction that came to us in the Qur'an. فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ So it is part of the Qur'an, but it is not part of the Qur'an as recited outside of where it is. Okay? Uh, and uh, there is a hadith uh, by the Prophet Sallallahu that is related by Ibn Mas'ud. He said, I said, أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم. So the Prophet Sallallahu asked him, يا ابن أم عبد أو عبد الله ابن مسعود uh, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم which means don't say السميع العليم don't, don't make it more beautiful than what it is. Don't polish it. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم And he said, this is how Jibreel taught me to recite it. Okay? And he got it, Jibreel got it from اللوح المحفوظ The primary uh, book of creation in which everything is kept with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so, do we say A'udhu Billahi Min Ash-Shaytan Rajeem before we recite Al-Fatiha in the Salah? Yes, you can do that before, uh, before reciting Al-Fatiha in the Salah. Uh, 
the only uh, reciter uh, among the major reciters is Hamza, uh, who does not do that. But the rest of the Qurra, they recite A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem before Al-Fatiha, uh, before reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. Uh, So last time we read and explained Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and the values and importance of starting everything with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and we mentioned the hadith that talk about this and also we mentioned the other hadith that says كل شيء لا يبدأ بالحمد لله فهو أبتر anything that starts without forwarding it with Alhamdulillah before you start, then it becomes cut off, which means useless. And this is why the khutab of Rasulullah sallallahu always start with Alhamdulillah. In some cases, Bismillah wa Alhamdulillah, you could also uh, hear the same. So if you read Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim you realize that it's only Bismillah and then Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim are two uh, names for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, two descriptive names of the holy names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why also when you read Alhamdulillah, you will see Rabbil Alameen as a descriptive name for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So basically, Bismillah, Walhamdulillah and Rabbil Alameen and then you repeat Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim to reinforce the same that you mentioned in the Basmala so Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim is in the Basmala and it is in the heart of Al-Fatiha itself as well uh, Al-Fatiha is Seven ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Al-Fatiha. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِي وَالْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِيمِ We have given you seven of what is repeated at least twice in the salah. Because Al-Fatiha is repeated in every rak'ah. And the minimum rak'at that we do are two for fajr. Right? or for the sunan. So it is repeated twice, yuthanna biha, which means you have to read it twice in every salah as a minimum total. So it is called as sab al-mathani as well. Uh, as we talk about al-fatiha and al-istaadha billah min al-shaytan, we need to know where is the root of shaitan comes from? Shaitan is from shayata and from shatana. Shayata and shatata and shatta all go to someone who goes extreme. Adam disobeyed Allah, Iblis disobeyed Allah, but the disobedience of Iblis is way far extreme than the disobedience of Adam. That's why Allah uh, taught Adam words to seek forgiveness and to repent. Huh? But Iblis got the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because his disobedience is rooted in the rejection of the command of Allah. What about Adam? Adam, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ عَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ آدَمَ مِنْ قَبْلْ فَنَاسِيَا وَلَمْ نَجِدْ لَهُ عَزْمًا It was a matter of forgetfulness, not deliberate disobedience. And definitely it was not out of arrogance like Iblis. So the difference uh, needs to be clear because some kids ask us about those questions and isn't Allah Ghafoor Rahim? Why did he forgive Adam and not Iblis? We have to have answers. 
So, uh, also uh, from a linguistic standpoint, uh, it is. It also comes from shata yashitu, like in food. When the food is burned, huh? you call shat tam shat. يعني احترق. It, it's burned. And the shaitan is burned in his own sinfulness in this life and in hellfire in the hereafter. So anyone who walks the footsteps behind the shaitan, following the shaitan, he should know that at the end, shaitan is going to Jahannam. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly mentioned, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, لا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان. Do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan. Why? Because we know where he is going. إن الشيطان لكم عدو فاتخذوه عدو. Take him for the enemy. It is. Why? إنما يدعو حزبه ليكونوا من أصحاب السعير. He only invites his followers, his party, to be among the people of hellfire. So that also needs to be explained. Why don't I follow the shaitan? Whether this shaitan is an outsider jinni or an insider human shaitan inside me or around me. Because shayateen are all destined to hellfire. Okay. Uh, So, shaitan again comes from shatat and shatan and shata yashitu, shiatan. It's all rooted in the same direction. And he is called rajim because in hellfire he will be stoned in hellfire. That's why called rajim from rajama, yarjum. المرجوم يسمى رجيم. If you stone somebody, you are condemning him as worthy of being stoned. This is what رجيم means. He is worthy. He deserves it to be رجيم. Some scholars say that بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم is a قسم, but this is a far-fetched uh, proposition. Because uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim is really an opening. You are invoking Allah's name in the beginning of the Qur'an and you are invoking his proper name, which is Allah, and you are adding to it two most beautiful names that he loves the most, ar-Rahman and ar-Rahim. And we explained this last time, so I will not go over this again. Qasam is vowing. It's a vow. It's a swear. Like when you say, uh, So all of these are Qasam. Allah is swearing by those. Okay? Kalla wal qamar, wal layli idha adbar, wal subhi idha asfar. So, Qasam is when Allah swears, and Allah swears by any of his creations that he either has given certain degree of greatness or he wants to draw our attention to their greatness or the signs in them so that we study those creations. Like al-shams, al-qamar, wal-najm, and so on and so forth. All of these are great creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are more formidable than we are. So we spoke about swearing in the Quran a lot. So I don't, I don't think I will need to go over those again. Surah uh, Al-Fatiha is a cause of envy by the previous religious communities, whether it is the Jews or the, the Christians. The Jews who were quite learned uh, when they heard 
Al-Fatiha, they said this surah, if it were revealed unto us, we would have marked the day as a holiday and we would have celebrated that day every time we read Al-Fatiha. This is how precious this surah is. Uh, in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi cited in Imam Muslim's collection on Abi Hurairah, the hadith is hadith Qudsi. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta-A'la says, قَسَمْتُ الصَّلَاةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي I have divided prayer between me and my servant. فَإِذَا قَالَ الْعَبْدُ uh, الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ قَسَمْتُ الصَّلَاةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي نُصْفَيْنِ I have divided and he called one of the names of Al-Fatiha. He called it الصلاة. قَسَمْتُ الصلاة. Referring to Al-Fatiha. He was not talking about the whole Salah. If my servant says, Alhamdulillah, I would say, Hamadani Abdi. My servant has praised me. We will talk about the meaning of Alhamd and the difference between Alhamd and Al-Shukr in a minute. Okay? فَإِذَا قَالَ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَثْنَى عَلَيَّ عَبْدِي my servant has uh, given me the best commendation there is to give me. Okay? Rabbil Alameen. Maliki Yawmiddin Majjadani Abdi. Which means my servant glorified me. He is the Lord of the worlds. And we'll talk about the meaning of the worlds in a minute or so. And when he says, Majjadani uh, Abdi, another time he says, Fawwada ilayya Abdi. What does it mean, Fawwada ilayya Abdi? It means my servant has delegated everything into my hand because he says, Rabbil Alameen. And because I am Rabbil Alameen, my servant has delivered all his matters into my hand. So he acknowledges my power. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Majjadani Abdi, my servant has glorified me. And Fawwada ilayya Abdi, it means the same thing. فَإِذَا قَالَ إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ when we say, Iyaka na'bud, you only do we worship. Wa iyaka nasta'in, you only do we seek help from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers us and says, Hadha bayni wa bayna abdi wa li abdi ma sa'al. This is between me and my servant, and for my servant, anything he asks. It's amazing that Allah is teaching us how to praise him how to pray to him, how to call on him, how to ask him, how to supplicate, how to make dua. He's telling us, in dua, you must give a forward, a preface of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ya dhal jalali wal ikram, O Allah, the only glorious one, the only generous one, the maximum generous who you are, you are the one who created the heavens and the earth and you created us. All of this is praise. Then you ask Allah for what you want. So this introduction is telling us and the Hadith Qudsi is telling us that reciting Al-Fatiha is a two-way street. You're talking to Allah what he taught you, how to talk to him. And he is answering what you're saying in a way that if you pay attention, you get the benefit from talking to Allah. So now, the question is, when we pray, when we make salah, and we read Al-Fatiha, do we wait for ourselves 
to hear the answer of Allah in our soul, in our heart? Or are we reciting like a fast train, not waiting for anything? How do we get the benefit of this open-ended two-way communication if in the beginning we crash read everything as if we are running in a fast train, high-speed train, we want to finish, we want to get it over with. While the Prophet وسلم, used to tell uh, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, Arihna biha ya Bilal, give us comfort, O Bilal, in it, which means in prayer. When he calls Bilal to make iqama, he would say, give us comfort in it prayer. He is, he is entering into a meeting mood with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is ready, he is excited to enter into the prayer. We need to imitate the spirit of the Prophet sallallahu when we enter into prayer, when we read Al-Fatiha and recognize that we are talking to Allah at the same time, Allah is talking to us. That should give us a pause. It should give us reason for reflection. Uh, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call Al-Fatiha Salah? And he says, Qasamtu salata bayni wa bayna abdi, I divided prayer. Because salah cannot be salah without al-fatiha. So it is a rukn, it is a pillar of prayer. You can't pray without reciting al-fatiha. Now, could we recite al-fatiha while the imam is reciting al-fatiha? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Could you wait for the imam to finish? and then recite Al-Fatiha? Yes, you can. What about if the Imam does not give me a chance, and I know that the Imam, this Imam does not give me a chance, I would recite with the Imam. As he is saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, I will be saying the same thing. Okay? That is also a way to to not create discrepancy between وَإِذَا قُرَأَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِتُوا When the Qur'an is recited, listen to it. And between, uh, which means you have to listen to the Qur'an when the Qur'an is recited. And between لا صلاة إلا بفاتحة الكتاب No prayer, no rak'ah will be a rak'ah unless we read Al-Fatiha as Musalleen. Should we do it in the Salah al jahriyyah and a Salah that is private? Yes, we should do it, whether it is Fajr or Dhuhr or Asr or Maghrib or Isha. Any prayer, we have to recite Al-Fatiha. It is a pillar of prayer, okay? So uh, after we say, إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين and we'll come to this if we can catch it tonight but briefly said this is when Allah answers he says هذا بيني وبين عبدي this is between me and my servant okay this is between me and my servant it means that this is a contract. SubhanAllah. It is a contract. And the heart of Al-Fatiha is this ayah. It captures the relationship between every human being and Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is your Lord. He is the only one that you may worship, you must worship, and you cannot worship anyone but him. And in the forwarding of the word, 
which in English means you only do we worship, which is different from na'budu iyak, we worship you. Iyaka na'bud means exclusively you are the only one we worship. But na'budu iyaka could mean we worship you, but we may also worship others. This is the language of the Quran. So Allah made it clearly exclusive. وَإِيَّاكَ نستعين is a liberating statement. When I only seek help from Allah, I am a free person. When I only worship Allah, I am a free person. So as much as these are two very serious commitments, contractual commitments that we make between us and Allah, at the same time, these are two very liberating statements and positions and belief systems that we must revolve our lives around, around our relationship with Allah in terms of worshiping none but Him and seeking help from none but Him. So does this mean if I ask my neighbor for help that this is haram? No, it is not. If I ask my brother for help, is this haram? No, no. But I should not ask anyone for things that only Allah controls. And as we know, he controls a lot of things. He controls everything. بِيَدِهِ مَقَالِيدُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ In his hands are the controls over everything. So more or less, when I have any need, I should ask him. But if I see my need in somebody else's hand, I should ask him. You understand? So my car broke. I ask Allah to help me get this car working. I see a mechanic or I have a number of a car repair shop, right? Should I seek their help? I should. But first, I should ask Allah to guide me to the best place and the best service so that my endeavor to repair my car is in his hand. Then I go, like if I become sick, do I go to the doctor? Yes, I go. But before I ask Allah for shifa, cure is in Allah's hands. But treatment is the function of the physician, right? So when I go to the doctor, I go to the doctor for treatment, not for cure. Cure, I ask Allah for. I hope this is clear now. So there is no confusion over Al-Istaana Billah, to seek help from Allah, and Al-Istaana Biman Hawli Min Al-Nas, to seek help from people around me. Uh, so let us go and start with the, uh, start with Alhamdulillah to continue Surah Al-Fatiha. We mentioned Bismillah and it's finished. Alhamdulillah. We have Alhamd, which is gratitude, right? And we have Alhamd, which means and includes a shukr. And we have Alhamd, which means praise. So, what is the difference between Alhamd and a shukr? Alhamd, Alhamd is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it can only be for Allah. So Alhamdulillah means all and the ultimate and the absolute and the unconditional praise all belongs to only Allah and Allah alone. 
but could I also praise someone else, say, he is generous? Could I say someone, he is fair-minded, he is just, he is kind? Of course, of course, I can do that. So what is the difference again between alhamd and al-shukr? Alhamd thana'un ala al-shakhs wa that. Hamd is to praise the person, the qualities of the person, or the qualities and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? But shukr comes for ni'mah or gift or something that you receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So you hear Sayyidina uh, Sulaiman saying, ذلك من فضل ربي ليبلوني أشكر أم أكفر. This is part of the blessings of Allah سبحانه وتعالى that He is testing me whether I would be grateful or I would be ungrateful. What was He talking about? The capacity to hear and understand the animals, the birds. Right? And other creations, the jinn. He could talk to them and they would understand. He could talk to birds and they would understand. And he would understand what they are saying. It's amazing. So he says, This is part of the blessings and bounties and gifts of Allah to test me. Would I be grateful or would I be ungrateful? What is he referring to? He is referring to gifts Allah has gifted him. So a shukr is for a gift. Alhamd is for the qualities of the person that you praise or commend. And you could also definitely commend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna rabbi latifun lima yasha. Allah is so discreet and compassionate for whatever he wills. Sayyidina Yusuf said that uh, when he was talking to his family after joining him in Egypt. So alhamd could include and cover a shukr. When you say to somebody, you are generous, right? Uh, you implicitly also are telling him, if he has gifted you something, you are also telling him, thank you for your gift. Okay? So do you have to say, alhamdu laka wa shukru laka? No, you could just say him, tell him, you are generous, you are just, uh, you came on time, I am grateful for what you have offered me. All of this would include alhamd to cover a shukr or a shukr exclusively for whatever he has done you of favor or offered you of gifts. So when we say alhamdulillah, which means all praise, all gratitude, all thanks belong exclusively to Allah, that means we should thank everybody for whatever they have done for us. This is shukr. And we should never praise anyone who is not worthy of that praise. I should never describe a cheating person as honest because that is deception and if I'm even saying it to myself I'm deceiving myself if I'm saying it to somebody else I am betraying their trust it is like in recommending somebody for marriage many of us are asked do you know this person and we keep hailing praise on the person without testing what we're saying, without discovering or asserting if what we're saying is correct. This is a violation of Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah means I praise Allah and I don't give praise to anyone who does not deserve my praise. It's an amazing understanding because when you say it is an exclusive offering and glorification of Allah, then don't squander it, don't waste it. It is something that you are responsible for. 
And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قُلْتُمْ فَعْدِلُوا When you speak, speak justly. Don't go overboard and don't undersell people's values. وَلَا تَبْخَسُوا النَّاسَ أَشْيَأَهُمْ Don't shortchange people for their value. So if you know something good about somebody and you want to praise them for it, don't go overboard. Say, I saw him praying in the masjid. If this is all you know, right? He gave me a ride one day and he offered me the ride. So I believe he was helpful. That's it. But don't go overboard. Don't inflate a statement into a book. Don't do that because that can create misunderstanding about your experience with him. A uh, few days ago, I got a call from a brother who was asking me about someone who claims to be coming to the masjid here. And I told him the following, and I want you to pay attention to this. I told him, number one, as an imam in a masjid, I cannot judge anybody. For me, everybody is angelic. They are in the house of Allah, and they are definitely either behaving their best or trying to behave their best. So my recommendation is futile, it's useless. He said, whom should I ask if not the Imam? I said, no, no, ask them to give you people who can be referenced to question about his character. Those who have dealt with him in money, those who had personal relationships visiting him and he visiting them, those who slept with him, he slept with them, he traveled with them, then you have a rationale for asking, okay? And then I added something that surprised him. I said, with all of that, you have to also be cautious and take all the recommendations with a bag of salt. He said, why? Since I'm asking good people, people that you recommend who are close and this and this. And I told him that people tend to make very positive commendations for people they love and very negative commendations for people they hate. So if, if you rely on what people say, this is what you get. You get the reflection of the relationship with the person. So if you ask somebody who works, for example, for the government in, in the security apparatus, right? If you ask them about somebody that they are investigating, they will tell you, stay away from him, right? But this may be your next door neighbor in the masjid, right? This may be someone that you know nothing but good manners, right? So what I'm saying is no recommendation should be taken without a grain of salt or a bag of salt, okay? So, and I am further learning and affirming this principle with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen because he is the only one who deserves the full spectrums of praise without reservation. Everyone else, we have to have reservations. And that's why, and that's why it is mentioned in the Quran, وَمَا شَهِدْنَا إِلَّا بِمَا عَلِمْنَا Don't give testimony or recommendation except of what you certainly know. Not what you assume, not what you think, but knowledge and knowledge only. Then I added one more thing. I said, anybody coming to recommend someone for you, after all the praise, ask them, do you know them well? If they say yes, tell them, why don't you tell me the rest of their character? Nobody's an angel. Tell me some of their weaknesses. Tell me some of the negative issues I need to know. I am giving them my daughter. Why don't you give me your knowledge if you know him well? So a person who recommends somebody 
without giving you their observation about their negative side, which we all have negative sides, right? Then either they are hiding this or they don't know him enough. They have not dealt with him in anger, in disagreements, in fights, which means he is not that close. So, Alhamdulillah should help us establish a way of thinking, a mindset with which we live. We take lightly recommendations we give about people. Somebody is applying for a job, oh, I need some recommendation, and then, oh, what do you want me to write? And you get his dictation, and because it's not going to cost you anything, it's a paper, right? But those who receive it are looking at it for honesty. They are looking for it to evaluate the person, right? Likewise, recommendation for marriage, recommendation for renting your place for somebody else, right? Because some people, you ask somebody who has an apartment or basement, would you please take him and then you say, make an agreement. He needs a place for two weeks. And you say, okay, two weeks are over and the person doesn't want to leave. Right? Four weeks are gone, he doesn't want to leave. And you ask him, you ask him for two weeks, why not? Why not move? And he said, because I don't have another place. Well, but you ask him for two weeks. You said two weeks are okay. You should have used the two weeks to look for the next place. Okay? So we have to be careful. When the Quran teaches us something that comes with certain limitations, we should observe those limitations and limits on our end. Uh, so Alhamdulillah, then comes Rabb Al-Alameen. Rabb, from the root of the same word, Rabba Yarbu Wa Yurabbi, which to grow and to develop. Okay? This universe in which we live is expanding. This is Islam and science. The Quran says, وَالسَّمَاءَ بَنَيْنَاهَا بِأَيْدٍ وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ Science just recently discovered that the distance between stars and planets distances are expanding. They are getting apart, which means the network of the universe structure is expanding. The universe is expanding. So, Rabb al-Alameen means the one who created al-Alameen and the one who is in control over al-Alameen and the one who knows al-Alameen, the one who grows al-Alameen, the one who provides for al-Alameen, the one who guides al-Alameen, right? as we read in the Qur'an consistently. إِنِّي ذَاهِبٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي سَيَهْدِينَ Ibn Ibrahim saying, I'm going back to Allah, my Lord, who is going to guide me. Right? وَرِزْقُكُمْ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَمَا تُعَدُونَ فَوَرَبِّ السَّمَاءِ A Rabb is a provider. Right? So when we say, رَبِّ Alamin we are acknowledging the subjugation of everything to his will, to his power, and to his control. So nothing is out of his control. What does this mean practically? It means our peace. It means our security. As Muslims, as believers, we should feel very content and very happy that Allah is the Lord of the worlds. Somebody would say, but the jinn, they are uncontrollable. If they touch you with something evil, nobody... No, 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 no. Allah is the Lord of the worlds, which means you refer everything to Him. And that works against 
the philosophers who thought that Allah created the world, there is a, creation, a creator, but the world is operating on its own. The sun wakes up by itself in the morning and it comes from Washington to California, covering the U.S. all the day. Right? That is not true. Because if it does on its own, right, then why does it appear one day? Why, why does it go into uh, Kusuf? Why does it hide behind the moon? Right? Why does it get covered by this, uh, the, the clouds? Right? So it's not working on its own. It is working in a whole system which we call the universe. And every creation in this universe is subject to the control, total control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Including us humans, including the jinns who live around us. Isn't this a good reason to feel peaceful? and to feel secure and to feel safe that nothing will happen in this universe without him allowing it to happen. Does this mean that Allah allows a good strong nation to destroy another nation? Yeah, he could allow it. Does Allah allow us to do evil? That's a choice that we have. If he allows you to do the evil you want, it is your responsibility. Don't blame him for it. Don't make a choice and then say, since Allah allows me, right? No, it's not a justification. Because Allah, who could stop you from any evil, could also stop you from any good thing, right? So why do you praise yourself for doing good and want his reward? And when you do bad, you want to blame him for it. He allows you to do good or evil based on your choice. And he guided you. We have guided man to both paths, both ways, the way to paradise and the way to hellfire. So the choice and the responsibility and the reward are all yours. And that's why when we, when we lose the choice, we are not accountable. If, if, you are, if you lose your mind and you do something wrong, does Allah hold it against you? No, He does not. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is The pen does not write the actions of three types of people. الطفل حتى يبلغ the child until he reaches puberty. Okay? The sleeping person until he wakes up. And the insane person until his sanity comes back to him. Someone is in a coma, right? Involuntarily, he throws his arms around and pushes a child sitting next to him on the floor and the child dies. Is he accountable? No, he's in a coma, right? So as much as we don't get the punishment for things we do when we are lacking judgment, then we should be careful when we have this judgment in place that we use our heads and our minds wisely. So when we say Rabbil Alameen, it should give us peace and safety that nothing happens in this universe. And that's why whatever happens, we say Qaddar Allahu wa ma sha Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained that thing to happen and whatever he ordains, it happens. Whatever he commands, it happens. Whatever he allows, it happens, okay? And this should be a good reason for us to be settled. Allah wants us to be settled. Allah doesn't want us to live a life of anxiety, a life of hyper feelings, hyper this, hyper that. He wants us to live a rational, reasonable life 
of peace and safety for ourselves and for our families and for our community. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Majjadani, Hamadani Abdi, Wa Majjadani Abdi is the answer we hear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with this, we will stop here for the Aisha prayer, inshaAllah. And next time, inshaAllah, we'll continue. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.